On behalf of Gray Decision Intelligence, I do want to thank you all for coming and we'll get started in just a moment. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, I think it's time to get started. Um, welcome to the Gray Decision Intelligence Demand Trend Webinar designed specifically for community college professionals. This is not going to be your average webinar. It's an opportunity to gain insights into labor market data for program evaluation and use data to debunk common myths about community college programs. We will show the importance of looking at regional data trends as they can vary quite a bit from national trends. There are a few housekeeping items to get started with. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a place labeled Q&A. Please feel free to add your questions there. We love getting questions. Sometimes it inspires us to build new products. We will get to as many as we can during this session, and we will follow up later with you if we run out of time. You will receive a link to the webinar recording and presentation slides in the next few days, so please look for that in your email. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bob Atkins, not only the founder of Gray Decision Intelligence, but also a program evaluation expert and a best-selling author among higher ed publications. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much um, and welcome everybody. And I wanna thank you all again for joining us today. Much appreciated and hope that uh, the presentation is helpful for all of you in the community college space. Let me get started here. Um, We've got an agenda for today that'll talk a little bit about what a program evaluation system is. Then we'll go into student demand. Uh, we'll talk about employment and current indicators, what's going on in the job market. We're gonna do for the first time a cut by geography. We'll look at New York, Indiana, and Oregon on this webinar so that you can understand how different it is from one state to another and within states often very different from one local market to another. Obviously, uh, we're not gonna dive into that local market dimension here, but when we do work with a client, we cut the data much more finely than by state. Uh, we get all the way down to the particular census tracts that they work in, which is about twice as precise as the zip code. And then finally, we have a new product we wanted to share with you today that uh, helps you to run the financials for a potential new program quickly and accurately. And then I'll summarize. So first question is, what the devil is a program evaluation system? Um, and all the data that's required to go into it, which we'll be sharing a chunk of today. Uh, we think that program evaluation systems are really a critical part of higher ed, uh, and they need to include four things uh, in terms of data. Data on markets, um, student demand, employment, competition, and degree level. Uh, margins, does the program make money or lose money? Um, or said differently, does it generate money that can be used to fund other programs that may not be able to stand on their own but are critical to the mission of the institution. Of course, a program has to meet your academic standards and it has to be aligned with the mission. But the system is actually bigger than data and uh, metrics. It, you need to involve the right people in the right process in order to make sound program decisions. That doesn't mean people in process without data works, it doesn't. But it's equally true that data without the right people, judgment and process is generally dysfunctional in higher ed and not necessary. So uh, we believe that this is sort of comprehensive view that looks at the data as well as the human aspect of decision-making is critical. So um, let's take a look at student demand now. And, and we think of three broad indicators that we keep track of, and we actually keep track of international demand. If any of you um, are interested in recruiting international students, that's part of our systems as well. But most people historically have relied on iPads uh, for student demand information. And you know the only information you can get by program out of iPads is completions. Uh, it has a couple of problems. Uh, first, it's strength. It's very comprehensive. Every Title IV institution is in there. And while there are substantial non-Title IV programs, things like cosmetology, it does cover the vast majority of all students in higher ed. Now, uh, the problem is that when we look at completions, first of all, the data starts out two years old. Uh, iPads only published the uh, 2022 data a few months ago, and we won't be seeing another iteration until next fall. So we're already a couple of years out of date. Uh, but if you're trying to understand trends in student demand, the data is actually quite a bit more out of date than that uh, because people choose their major 
uh, when they enter school or shortly thereafter. So it, it, we, we're looking at data that's two to four years uh, behind 2002, all the way back to 2018, when a student may have decided that they wanted to come in and take a nursing program. So it's not very good information when it comes to current trends. It's good in terms of overall competition and general program size, uh, but trends, it's just way out of date. So we complement that with two other sources, enrollment data from the National Student Clearinghouse, which updates three times a year and is by program. So you can get a very good sense of what current enrollment trends are and what programs are in more demand than others. And then we start to look forward, um, Google is a, it gives us a window into what people are looking for. We're not yet in school. So that gives you a little bit of a future look, maybe three to six months out of the particular academic programs that are in students' minds these days. So let's take a look at Google. Uh, first question, how do you read this chart? Well, the gray lines are 2022 data. The dark blue lines are 2023. And the light blue lines are 2024. So what we're hoping to find is 2024, the light blue being higher than the dark blue. And then ideally all of that would be higher than the gray. Well, we're partway there this time. Uh, this year is up 4% over last year, but a little bit down relative to 2022 as we came out of COVID. So um, still encouraging. If we look um, back at the last six months, uh, Google search volumes have been up every month for the last six months year over year. Um, so this gives us a seventh month in that series. And if we will see in a minute what's happened to enrollment, but what you, what if you get make a long story short, this period from January last year through June about was pretty flat um, year over year. And then we see this uptick. So I'm hoping that uptick will run through into enrollment going forward. Um, it's gonna cost us though, you gotta go out and buy Google searches if you wanna play in this game. And we keep track of this to give it, everybody a sense of what the relative level of competition is in the marketplace. As competition intensifies, the cost per click goes up. Um, and you know the $15 a click might not sound like a lot, uh, but you have to keep in mind that for every click, uh, you have a very small probability you'll actually get a student, roughly one in 100, um, though that varies by program, institution, and so forth. But if you keep that in mind, then, you know, if you got a student by uh, buying Google Clicks, uh, what it would cost you about $1,500 a student to round one up. So not cheap. Um, and as I say, it does give you a sense of competitive intensity. In this case, it's been fairly flat. Uh, it went through a period where it was pushing up well over $15, um, dropped back last year, more to the 14 range, and now seems to be headed back towards 15 bucks. So um I suppose if you were stock, you'd say it's been trading in a range between 14 and 15 and uh, 1550. Now, um, let's take a look at what's go growing uh, in terms of Google search volumes. And here we're going to do a little comparison between what's growing in the US and what's growing in Oregon. So you can get a sense of how different it is when you look at one market versus another. But first, what's going on? Um, we've got a very strong showing by healthcare programs here. Uh, we've got four that made the top 10, Surge Tech, Physical Therapy Assistant, Occupational Therapy Assistant, and Rad Tech. We've got four CTE programs, Aircraft Maintenance Tech, the Esthetician, and this in case is specifically Skin Care, Barbering, and Cosmetology. Then we have a couple of others, uh, Digital Marketing and Divinity. And Divinity is a funny one. It crops up periodically in our data. Uh, and as you'll see, it, it, it's doing very well at the national level. We had in Oregon, there's actually very little overlap between what's important in Oregon and the U.S. There are only three programs that are in both data sets in terms of the fastest growers, and that Divinity Ministry is not one of them. Uh, the three are esthetician, barbering, and cosmetology. Um, and in terms of what is growing in Oregon, we've got vet tech, information technology, computer science, cybersecurity, a bunch of IT or technology related things. Then we have our uh, CTE programs, cosmetology, barbering, esthetician, nail specialist and manicurist, culinary arts and chef training, and finally education general. So the main takeaway here really is not just what programs are of interest out there, but the importance of getting local information on student demand because it varies a lot. Um, and there are instances where 
and you'll see later where we could bring up a state and have there be no overlap in terms of the fastest growing programs with the national data. So what's going on in enrollment, new student enrollment for fall specifically? Uh, finally, we've seen a turnaround. If we look at certificate level, it's up 7% year over year between 21 and 22, and then crept up another 1% in 2023. At the associate level, a little bit more challenging. It declined into 2021, started to come back in 2022 up 4%, but that plateaued and we're only up 0.8% in 2023. So there is a, I think the best we can hope for here is that the decline has stopped. Um, there doesn't seem to be a fast turnaround in volumes at the associate level. There are, however, some very popular programs. Auto body collision repair tech up 39%. Several other CTE programs made the top 10. Culinary arts, industrial mechanics, maintenance tech, and welding tech. And keep an eye on this welding tech and the industrial mechanics. You'll see they trend through the data. Um, I think this one, industrial mechanics or mechatronics, is particularly interesting. Great program, very good wages. Uh, but unfortunately, most students don't know what it is. So the student demand is often weak and very encouraging to see it trending up. Again, a very good program, lots of very good outcomes for students. And uh, I think underserved in many ways in higher ed. It just hasn't caught on yet. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, healthcare, surprisingly few entries in terms of growth, health services, nursing assistant, patient care, and registered nursing. I remember if I went back two years, um, this list would be almost entirely healthcare related. Uh, U.S. fastest growing new enrollment in fall. So now we're moving over to the enrollment side. Um, healthcare is doing pretty well here. Got four of the top 10 programs, ultrasound tech, health services, allied health general, rad tech, and political science government uh, general. We only have one CTE program that made the top 10 in terms of enrollment um, with electrician up 16%. And then we have a variety of other programs, visual and performing arts up 33%, cybersecurity, not a surprise, up 25%. And here's my personal favorite as a history major, history general up 20%. You don't see that very often, so go history. Um, child care provider up 10% and speech communication and rhetoric up 8%. Now let's take a, uh, a detour, if you will, out of traditional higher ed and look at non-degree courses and what's going on there. I think many of you are thinking about what you can do with certificates and importantly, where you can even get data to understand which certificates may be more attractive than others. We would suggest taking a look at your MOOCs, the massively open online courses. Um, Coursera is an example, not the largest, but it's one we track. We also track Udemy, which is one of the largest and there's several others, these players out there. And some of them are kind enough to publish how many students are enrolled in their programs. So you can see what's big and what's not and how fast things are growing. So here we're looking at unit change year over year. And the data is the number of people trailing in the trailing 12 months who've enrolled in a given course. And it really is kind of mind boggling to think that almost a million students have enrolled in just one course on uh, Coursera, foundations, data, data everywhere. And this course is persistently over seven, 800,000 students per year. So huge course, lots of interest in it. Um, science of well-being. Uh, you know, most of these things tend to be tech, but there are a handful of things that you'll see here that are not technically related, but still of interest to students. That's one of them. Um, there are several others, though. Learning how to learn, introduction to psychology, and project initiation, starting a successful project. I'm gonna emphasize psychology here. I think with all the mental health issues in the United States, particularly amongst young people, uh, there's a growing interest in everything to do with psychology and brain science. So if there's an area for growth, I think this is one of them um, that will be very well received uh, by potential students. And there are jobs for psychology graduates. Surprising enough, they're not in psychology. Uh, there are all sorts of other fields like marketing. Um, so it's not a dead end. Um, it can lead into graduate school for psychology and social work, um, but it also leads to many other places. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, now, uh, the tech side, we've got um, data, data everywhere, UX design, tech support fundamentals, 
Of course, we got AI here, AI for everyone, crash course on Python, and data analysis with our programming. I'm going to come back to AI for everyone. This is another field where I think, you know, you can fill classes. Uh, everyone's interested in AI. I think there are things to be taught at every degree level, right down to uh, undergraduate certificate. Uh, that might be as simple as how to prompt an AI engine, uh, but everyone's interested, everyone's gonna be using this. And I think uh, there's a huge growth opportunity for folks that are able to teach AI at a variety of levels, um, from deep science at the PhD level on how to actually create a LLM, for example, which is a very complex mathematical problem, um, to you and I using uh, learning how to use uh, chat GPT to write an email and really everything in between. Now let's turn to national employment and see what's going on in the job market. Before I do though, let me just take a moment and remind everyone why we do both student demand and employment. Um, in colleges across the country and particularly in community colleges, there's often a tendency to look solely at employment data when you're trying to decide what to do with new programs. And there's often an employer standing at your shoulder, whispering in your ear, telling you, I really need this, this program. Could you please teach people? Um, unfortunately, employer demand is loosely linked to student demand, and you really need to know both, or there's a very substantial risk that you'll open a program that employers want that students don't want to attend. We've had two clients who went down this path um, not using data to pick programs. And in one case, they invested a half a million dollars in an optics lab and only ended up with five students. In the other, they invested a million dollars and got no students. So it's not that employment's not important. It's just that you need student demand data as well because it doesn't do the employer any good if you launch the program and no students enter or graduate from it. Now, um, the other catch when you're looking at data it, about programs and jobs is trying to understand what students are going to do after they graduate and what kind of jobs they'll get. There's a huge amount of misinformation out there about this. Um, and it's predicated on this concept called direct prep, um, or what are students directly prepared to do when they graduate? Great example would be nursing. Uh, people who study nursing would predictably enough get a job in nursing. And in fact, that's generally true for nurses. Um, they're up here in this 11, um, where you know some a very small number of programs actually graduate and send 60 to 80 percent of their students on into fields for which they're directly prepared. But out of our 634 we explored, 493 sent less than 20 percent of their students into the fields for which they were directly prepared. They went on and did something else. So it's very unlikely if you're a history major that you're going to become a historian. You could, God forbid, like me, if go on and start a business. You could become a lawyer. You could do lots of things. But historian is really not very likely at all. And yet, when we look at crosswalks between programs and jobs, oftentimes, in fact, almost all the time, there's this direct prep linkage between one and the other. And it's very inaccurate. So it one of the major sources for this is the National Center for Education Statistics, or NCES. Here's an example um, of human services. And NCES says someone who graduates in human services is directly prepared for exactly three occupations. Community and social service specialists, social and community service managers, and social and human service assistants. Reality is a little different. Human services graduates work in 145 industries. They work in um, 675 occupations and 22,000 different companies. So this very narrow view of what you can do is also very misleading. Now, oftentimes when you come over and look at what people really do, you find that the jobs they go into are much more attractive than the ones that NCS says. Here I'd say it's a more complex and not a very attractive view if you think of it in terms of just income people are likely to get. And obviously if you're working, interested in working with people, income might not be your primary goal. And it's not that we don't need human services workers, uh, quite the contrary, it's just we don't pay them very much. And you can see, yes, they got one right. Um, social and community service managers is indeed one of the top 10 fields that people go into. But there are a variety of others, some um, home health and personal care aides that really don't need a degree at all. 
but general operations managers is a pretty senior job. Child and families, social workers, executive administrative assistants, customer service reps, managers, project managers, HR specialists, and teaching assistants. So that's just a handful, 10 of the 675 occupations that people really go into. So do keep this in mind when you're analyzing programs um, and you're concerned about what roles people are going to get when they graduate or how many jobs they'll be. Chances are the data you're looking at is wrong. And it's not a little bit wrong. It's based on this concept where there'll only be three occupations that are related to a particular field instead of the 675 that really are. That means the pay is going to be incorrect because it's not going to be averaging the right um, occupations. It also means a number of jobs is going to be massively incorrect because it's looking at three professions rather than 675. So be wary of that when you're looking at labor market data. Ask how they do their crosswalks. It's a very detailed and I have to admit a little bit tedious issue, but it's terribly important if you want to have accurate data. Now let's take a look at what's going on in the U.S. job market. And most of you are probably well aware of this, but job postings are trending down. The Federal Reserve has been tightening interest rates and that generally speaking drops uh, will, will cause job openings to decline. We are still sitting on the lowest unemployment rate in my lifetime, under 4%. Um, it used to be theoret thought to be theoretically impossible to get under five, but here we are. Um, so a decline in job postings is not entirely bad. Um, it might mean that we're getting more imbalance between the number of people who are actually able to work and the number of jobs that are out there. Uh, it also is true that the job postings have been declining uh, coming out of COVID, uh, they they really shot up um, to replace all the people that have been laid off during COVID. And it's been coming down. But I would say at this point, that effect has probably worked itself out, uh, primarily in 2023. So a drop from 2023 is a real decline, uh, not a decline off an artificially inflated number from COVID. Which occupations are growing? Well, remember, if overall we're going down 26%, you're not going to find a lot that are growing. Um, and in fact, the top one here is payroll and timekeeping clerks. Um, so now that we hired all those people coming out of COVID, we've got to keep track of them. Then we have insurance claims, commercial pilots, photographers, tax examiners, and that this will boom for another few months uh, until we get through tax season. Detectives and criminal investigators, firefighters, information security analysts, tellers, and bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks are the top 10 at the U.S. level. Um, people often now are concerned about skills as they should be. Um, this gives you an idea of how much people get paid who have a given skill. Um, so it doesn't mean that that particular skill tells a whole story, but it does mean that if I've got that skill, the kinds of jobs I, I'm likely to end up in um, pay this amount. So videography, as an example, pays about $70,000 a year. Construction management um, pays much more, almost 90000 well, a little over $90,000. Um, and then you can see several healthcare, some of which are relatively low paid medical assistants. And that probably is pretty closely related to the medical assisting job title. Um, but patient comfort, much higher. I suspect that's because it also includes nursing. Um, money management, actually surprisingly low. Call center experience at $40,000. And lean manufacturing over here, a uh, bit higher. And some teaching in the middle um, at about 50. And vehicle inspection, also about 50. So uh, you might well ask, we've heard a lot about the inequity in incomes in the United States. And certainly if you're looking at job postings, it would support that perspective. But it's not surprising to find that lower paid jobs have many, many more job postings. There are almost 12 million job postings for that where the pay is $25,000 or less. At the other end of the spectrum, people who make $250,000 on average, there are only 42,000, 43,000 job postings overall in the US. So it is a very skewed distribution, not really surprising, um, but you'd like to see more uh, in the middle. And there is some, a fair amount here in uh, the 50 to $100,000 range with a healthy million job postings at $100,000. Now let's take a look at what this data looks like in three states, New York, Indiana, and Oregon. Uh, let's start with New York. What's growing in New York? Well, esthetician is leading it, and that's skincare specialist, barbering, cosmetology um, among the CTE programs. And there are three other CTE programs, HVAC, culinary arts, 
and commercial and truck and bus driver. Now, as we go through these, you'll see almost everything is different as you go from one state to another. Um, but there are a handful that will be consistent. Um, commercial truck is one. Esthetician will often see in barbering as well. In healthcare, we've got uh, five pro four programs, excuse me, on the list. Dental assisting up 26%, surge tech up 24%, rad tech up 24%, and physical therapy assistant up 22%. What's going on with enrollment in New York? Well, as you'll recall, our overall enrollment for associate and below was hovering around 1% last year. Uh, New York is actually doing better, up 3%. Of course, it did a little worse last year. It was down two versus up four um, for the US. So it's bouncing back, I guess you could say. Um, what programs are hot? Well, almost nothing that was international data. Um, we've got biology general. Um, interior design, radiation therapy, education general, electromechanical tech up 30%, restaurant culinary up 30%, construction and engineering tech up 30%. And then we do have the three that overlap with the national list. Health services, allied health up 34%, welding tech up 36%, and cybersecurity up 38%. Jobs in New York, even tougher job market than we saw nationally. As you recall, nationally, we were down 26%. In New York, job postings have actually dropped 40%. So tough job market um, starting to uh, occur in New York. Um, there are still some fields that are going up, but very few. Uh, claims adjusters, child care workers, computer and information systems managers, and bookkeepers all managed to grow. The rest of our fastest growing occupations actually were down. Um, We've got training and development specialists down 7%, social and community services managers down 12, light truck drivers down 13, first line supervisors, retail sales workers down 13, licensed practical and vocational nurses has fell 17%. That's surprising to me to see that big a drop in a healthcare program as important as that. Securities and financial services agents down 19%. What skills do people want? This is an area where when I looked at it, there's a lot of commonality. Um, in New York, we see Microsoft Office, marketing, mental health, accounting, construction, billing, project management, registration, data entry, and diversity and inclusion. You'll see most of these actually repeat in other states. So even though the top 10 jobs may be different, the top 10 skills tend to be fairly consistent across markets. They're not 100% consistent, but they're fairly consistent. So in that sense, their skills may be a more reliable thing to build programs around than a particular job. Now let's turn to Indiana. Um, in Indiana, you remember esthetician made our list before. Uh, barbering has made it. Um, auto mechanics, tech, uh, cosmetology, general, and culinary arts. But we also have some healthcare programs here we didn't see before. Registered nursing, dental assisting, uh, physical therapy assistant, I believe was on our prior list, and surge tech. And these are pretty good growth rates. Um, surge tech up 43% in terms of enrollment. I shouldn't overlook legal assistant paralegal. And we also have 31% growth in auto mechanic, uh, cosmetology general, and culinary arts. Now, as we look at Indiana, that it's actually bounced back quite a bit better than the national average in terms of overall enrollment, up 5% in 2022 and another 5% in 2023. So it's coming back faster, certainly than New York, and actually quite a bit faster than the U.S. as a whole. So as we look at enrollment by program um, and what's growing fastest, metal, medical billing and coding leads the list. Uh, you'll note we only have two that overlap with the national data, electrician and rad tech. Information science is a new entry. Sheet metal, sheet working we didn't see nationally or in New York. Registered nursing up 35%. Um, that we have seen, not at that growth rate. Uh, agriculture general up 24%. Information technology up 20%. Medical health, clinical assistant specialist up 20 And iron working up 13%. So there's clearly still some heavy manufacturing left in this market that we did not see either nationally or in the local data from New York. Bob, can I interrupt you for one moment Certainly. before we get uh, too 
much further along, we do have a question. And with respect to what recent graduates will be able to do upon landing their first job, um, this guest brings up the concern about hiring Gen Z and others due to the lack of soft skills, et cetera. That said, do you have any insight about how colleges need to prepare their graduates for what industry is expecting and how do we close the divide? It's a great question. Um, I don't think there's any substitute for work um, in terms of learning how to work. So anything you can do to find internships for your students, very, very helpful. Um, we have to remember that part of the problem, people blame this on college, but a big part of the problem is that a student graduating from a community college may only be 20 years old. They're really not a grown up yet in many cases. Um, and if they come out of a one year program, they're even younger. And, you know, I hate to say this, but that's particularly an issue for guys. So anything they can do to get real work experience, to understand the demands of the workplace, to turn off their darn phone so that they're not doing text messages while they're supposed to be working, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those are important things. And I think they almost require you to be in the workplace in order to really get it and understand uh, what it's like to have to earn a living and to understand that, you know, the world doesn't owe you a living. Um, you know, if you don't want to work, that's fine. You just won't have a job. Um, and that's kind of a harsh message for people in today's youth that the world actually doesn't care about them at all. If they want to work, um, people will hire them. And as long as they work, they'll keep them. And when they stop, they won't. So that kind of mental toughness is just not in great supply. And as I say, I think internships are a way to get it. Very difficult to teach in the classroom, um, especially with um, how sensitive students are now and how likely they are to, you know, lodge a complaint should you uh, try and cheat, treat them in a way that's, let's call it less than gentle. I don't mean to be rude, by the way, just tough. Um, job trends in Indiana, uh, our leading program was industrial engineering techs. Again, kind of a heavy metal bending uh, area. Um, also consistent with that um, program we talked about before of combining mechanical and technical capabilities. Uh, hard to find people that can do that and uh, very good uh, jobs and well-paid if they get out. Um, social and community service managers up 54%. Financial managers looking good here up 58%. First line supervisors of retail um, up 21%. Uh, security guards like truck drivers up in the teens. Trucking you'll see throughout uh, bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks up 10%. Social and human service assistants up, uh, well, flat year over year, as were preschool teachers, and a small decline in administrative assistance. Now, I mentioned skills before, and I think when you look at this list, you realize that the level of consistency there is. Okay, first of all, Microsoft Office. So if you don't teach your students anything, please make sure they know how to use Word and Excel. Um, these are fundamental job skills. They're like reading and writing now, um, and they're needed in almost every profession. So that's really central. It's not about taking one course their first year. It's really about having it woven through the curriculum. So by the time they graduate, they're completely comfortable operating in, those, in a Microsoft Office environment. Marketing, number two, construction, um, still hot, number three, diversity and inclusion, um, this uh, has made our list a couple of times, um, so it's becoming a workplace requirement. Career development, accounting, registration, merchandising, billing, and data entry. Billing is another one that made the list several times. Accounting is a widespread need as well. Now let's take a look at the state of Oregon and see what's going on up there. Um, fastest growing programs in Oregon, vet tech up 52%, um, information technology up 38%, computer science up 25%, cybersecurity up 23%. Let me cycle back to vet tech because I mentioned the risk of starting a program based solely on what employers want. There is a risk in, in really investing in programs that only students want because you take vet tech as an example, there are jobs, but the pay is really terrible. And so really thinking through what the right blend is for your institution is very important so that you don't bring people into college and have them graduate um, and earn wages that frankly you could have earned out of high school or even before high school. So um, it's a 
it, it's not that vet tech isn't the real job and there aren't things to learn. There are. The pay is, is just terrible, though. Um, cosmetology, up 22%. Barbering, up 19%. Esthetician, up 19%. So these personal care um, categories we see fairly consistent through the data. Nail specialist and manicurist as well. They have culinary arts and education in general. Oregon, um, been fluctuating a lot. Uh, if you'll recall, our national data up 4%, up 1% in the last two years. Oregon looked like it was staging a major comeback up 7%. Then it dropped off last year. Enrollment actually fell by 9%, very substantial. So quite discouraging there not to see the leveling trend that we've seen in other markets. Job posting data down 30%. So job postings in Oregon are a little bit worse than the national numbers, better than New York. Um, on the job trends, what's hot and what's not, um, social security, well, first of all, notice there are only four occupations that are above zero. Um, that's, again, not unusual when we're down 30% overall in a market, but still um, concerning. Social and community service managers, we've seen this one a couple of times. Recreation workers, licensed practical and vocational nurses, we've seen this a couple of times as well. Firefighters, then self-enrichment -enrich teachers, heavy tractor, trailer, truck drivers. This has been on our list, albeit growing in other markets. Home health and personal care aides, coaches, sales managers, and nursing assistants. And I uh, would come back to the skills um, in Oregon, and I was really struck with where jobs and enrollment and other uh, data sets we talked about were very, very different from one state to another how similar these skills are from one state to another. Microsoft Office always is going to top the list. Marketing was in our top few in the other states. Mental health is new. Construction, consistent across the list. Accounting and billing and data entry, um, consistent. E-Verify uh, is different uh, from one to another. This is the federal government's um, immigration authorization system. Project management, consistent across the list. And finally, registration. Now let's do something very, very different. If you all are thinking of launching a new program, one of the things that is a bit daunting often if you're um, an academic and even more daunting if you're an academic who, like me, majored in history or English or something like that, where you haven't been doing numbers a lot, um, you often are required to put together a business case for a new program. And there's several things about that case that are very problematic. One of them is how many students are you likely to get? And another is, what are all the other financials associated with the program? How much is it going to cost me to set it up, to market it, uh, to run it? And so to help our clients out, uh, Yosef uh, Aljabi, who uh, is about to uh, speak, um, built a system to not only predict how many students you're likely to get, but what the financials would be. Let me turn it over to him. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, everything Bob mentioned actually is relevant to what's coming next, so it's not like it's completely different. So as Bob said, one of the most ambiguous answer uh, questions, you know, admins ask when launching a new program is, how big is this program going to be? And this has two parts, how big it's going to be when I launch it and how big it's going to be when it gets to the peak of it. Um, and this is where, as Bob mentioned, um, what I've been working on here at Gray DI, um, and you know, we've we've had several um, launches and successful uh, ones as well using this one. So I'm going to to show you this. Before I show you the financial model that Bob mentioned, it's important to know that it's built on predict program size, which is one of our other uh, products that uses all the data Bob talked about, the student demand data, the employment data about institutions, things in uh, PES markets and things outside of it to answer one specific questions. How big is a new program going to be at a specific institutions? So the predict program size takes into all of those data and analyze them and show uh, schools a way to um, evaluate and rank all those programs that are potential no school have launched 200 programs at some point in one time. 
they all launch them one by one and just ranking and prioritizing those based on the size is just another way of doing it. So with that background, just the only thing you need to know is predict program size predicts the size range of, an, uh, of a program at an institution and the financial planning piece is built on top of it. So I'm going to share my screen and show you one of the pages that we thought would be cool to show you on the webinar. So I'm going to explore for a fake institution, um, the financial planning for their BSW or bachelor in social work. So looking at this does not um, make any sense. We chose the program, the predict program size says, this program for this fake institution is going to have 10 to 24 completions. And more, most likely in that range, it's going to be 14. So using this tool, um, an institution can take that number, that the output of the model and put it in. And that's what I'm gonna do. Or if they have their own estimates, they can put them in as well. So taking the information of what the predict program size uh, gives out, as well as information about the institution's retention, the tool says, oh, so you should expect in the first cohort, seven freshmen, in the second cohort, 12 freshmen, and in the third cohort, 18 freshmen. And as you see, as I just inputted this, um, arithmetics behind the scenes, uh, as well as some uh, grade DI data played into place to find, plan the financial of this program. Looking just at this, you'll see that on the right-hand side is where all of your data decisions come into place. And on the left-hand side, how those data decisions reflect on how much money this program is gonna give, get me in the next six years. What are my enrollments going to look like by year? And how much new faculty I need to hire if those new students are new by FTEs? Right under this, looking into the financials, what are the revenue? What are the costs to launch this program and operate it and teach the courses? And a simple income statement at the bottom. So let's see what we can change. We can change the retention rates and those will have a big uh, effect and we're gonna show you in a second. We can change, is this program going to be a, an online uh, specific or an on-ground or a mix in, in between both? And what is the tuition for each? What's the tuition for online? What's the tuition for on-campus? Um, what are my fees? Do I have out of state? Do I have in-state? And that comes in um, significant for state institutions. Right under that, we can adjust the cost. There are two types of costs into launching a new program. That would be operational and pre-launch costs and instructional costs. The operational include things like how what is the salary for the program director and admin. So in this fake scenario, I put $170,000. However, I said this program is going to be part of their job, and that part is 25%. Using the benefit rates and the salary increase, now I have what the program director and admin is gonna cost me for this new program. Another thing is I want to pay some marketing at the beginning, and I want to pay 5% of my revenue on marketing as the program is growing. So I input this as input. This is a new program to the institution, so I need to create some courses and it's gonna cost me 20,000 to create a new course and I need five of those. Same thing, I need to modify three courses and it's gonna cost me $2,000 to do that. So all of these are pre-launch and operational expenses. Next, we have the instructional costs. Instructional costs at Grade EI, we always look at it to the lowest brick of calculation, which is student credit out, which is the cost to teach one student one credit at this program. Now, if you have those estimates internally, perfect. Um, if not, this tool is linked to Grade DI Benchmarking Consortium that we can use the 
um, tens of institutions we have in that database that we know their cost and we can give you an average cost to teach a BSW program. And so in this instance, I put $105, but I can up it up or down and I can even increase the uh, growth rate. And lastly, same thing with the discounts. Some institutions are heavily on scholarships, institutional scholarships, some are not. So what is the average discount rate? So all of those are inputs that I, or you as a school admin input uh, to take a look at what my program financials are gonna look like. Many of those have a lot of effect on the performance. So I'm gonna explore with you so I have my retention rate year one to year two as 84%, which is considered a really high one. Um, however, I've seen it. We've all probably heard of it, that there are some programs and some uh, schools that have 40% retention rate. So as you can see, as I change this, my year six total revenue dropped $300,000, even more. My break even barely did not change, but it's almost there. Same thing. Let's say you say, oh, I want to increase my tuition by $1,000 for on-campus in-state student. We can do that, and we can see how the revenue is changing over. Now, this is if you use the predict program size output. But let's say you say, oh, no, I have already other uh, students lined up. I'm going to expect much more students coming in in year one, maybe it's going to go down in year two or year three. And let's say you have already 15 students expected to start in the first year you launch this program. I input this and I see how things are changing. Many of this can be um, in your head simple, uh, but as you sit down and do it, Excel has been the friend for admins. And, you know, as long as Bob say, teach it to uh, your students, it's still tedious to do it over and over uh, for a specific purpose. And let's see if we have any Q and A. Okay. Or Bob, if you want to jump in. No, um, so any questions out there about the uh, calculator here, our financial model? Um, I, we, we built, I can't tell you how many times we built these models, uh, one at a time, each time in Excel and then, you know, hunted around to try and find them and replicate them. So for us, it's great to just have a system that where we can go in, adjust the critical variables and get a, a more than just a reasonable estimate, um, a fairly well-grounded estimate of what the economics of a program are likely to be. So thank you very much, Yosef. Absolutely. Let me sum up where we are. Um, if you can share my screen. Um, good news, Google searches for academic programs rose 4% year over year. Um, I think we've had six, seven months of increase. There is reason to be optimistic that um, enrollment will actually start to tick up, despite all the things you hear about the demographic cliff. And I guess I shouldn't get us started um, on that topic because it's one of my, I, I think, one of the great illusions of all time. Um, digital marketing was up 102%. Google cost per click came down a little bit, but it's at a pretty high level, over $15 per click. Fall certificate new enrollment up 1% year over year. Associate enrollment up a little bit less at 0.8%. Auto body collision repair tech and other auto programs up, or grew nicely. Auto body repair tech specifically up 39%. Sonography ultrasound up 33% at the associate level. Great program, good earnings, and nice growth in the program itself. Most traditional labor market sources have a problem, um, so do be very careful with them. Uh, they rely on these direct prep cost walks, and they dramatically understate the diversity of jobs that a person can get with a given degree. Um, it, we use the human service example, where they it only shows three occupations, but they're really 675. Same story for history. There are five direct prep occupations and almost 500 that people really go into. So just be aware, um, be especially careful if you have a widget on your website 
that tells people what they can do with a degree, that widget may actually be turning students off because you get an overly narrow perception of what they can do with their degree, especially a liberal arts degree. Academic program data varies a lot by state. And within a state, it'll vary for your local market. So um, try and get to data that is local uh, because it will be different. And those differences are quite material and important. You remember in Indiana, we saw all the sort of manufacturing, mechatronics, metal bending kinds of things. They really didn't exist in the other states we looked at. Oregon's um, 10 fastest growing uh, for enrollment had no overlap compared to national. And New York only had one in common. So those differences really do matter. And uh, they are, of course, embedded in our systems. If you need the information, um, you can get it not only for your state, um, but for your local market as well. So thanks again for joining us today. Much appreciated uh, and hope that you enjoyed the webinar. And please feel free to rejoin us. Uh, we'll be giving the next update on March 27th. We do these on Wednesdays uh, every month. And if you want to hear what's going on in the bachelor's world, that's Thursday. And I'm going to give my little plug. You heard me talking about the, the demographic cliff, but I've actually been working um, on a book called, we're going to call Grow, Grow, Crow, and it's built off a podcast I've been doing. I'm just tired of hearing all this gloom and doom about higher ed. I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong at a very fundamental level. I think higher ed is essential uh, to the success of our country and to the individuals and to the earnings of individuals. Um, so that's what Grow, Grow, Grow is about. Um, I would, If you want to be cheered up and find out growth strategies, um, please feel free to listen to the webcast and keep an eye out. I'm going to get this book done sooner or later and uh, get it out so you all uh, can understand that there are opportunities for growth in higher ed and the value that it creates uh, for your students and the society at large. Thanks very much. Bob, do you have time for one more question? I know we're we're getting I, close I, to I, the I, end here. Questions as we have. So um, let's see. Uh, it's hard to know where to start on it on the cliff. Um, I believe there is intentional deceit. Um, I don't think that's the foundation of it. Um, but uh, you know, this all goes back to Nathan Graw's book, which I have here on my desk, and um, demographics and demand for higher education. And a couple of things. First, keep in mind that. Um, his clip was supposed to start in 2026. And I talked to lots of people who say, well, we're experiencing a demographic cliff. Well, it's not even supposed to be here yet. So um, it may come. But if you look at population in the United States, high school age, it already declined from 4.4 million to 4.2 million. I'm not looking at a sheet of paper right now for these numbers. So uh, feel free to double check. Um, but during that time where the, pop the population declined, the number of high school graduates actually was flat because the graduation rate from high school went up uh, to, I think it's now about 86%. So it offset the decline in the raw number of students. So if you've had a decline, it's not because of population usually. Um, there, I'm sure there are areas where there is a real population issue, don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, that's not the problem. If we, first of all, again, the cliff hasn't been supposed to happen and yet We've been going through enrollment declines for the last 10 years. So if it were about demographics, it shouldn't have happened yet. And yet it has. So what's, what is going on is fewer people who graduate from high school are choosing to go to college. That's a very serious problem. It's not that we have fewer graduates. It's the choices they make after they graduate that are really killing higher ed. Now, there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and I, I don't even profess to know all of them. But I think one of the most important takeaways is that it's a very complex phenomenon and any single variable is not going to explain um, enrollment rates in college. Uh, so demographic cliff is, and demographics in general are just one variable, one of many. Now let me give you one that really, really matters much more than the raw population numbers. And that is the economy. There is a 74% R squared, a statistical level of prediction between um, the unemployment rate and the propensity to go to enrollment in college. So it is extremely rare to find one variable like employment that explains 75% of the variation in another variable like enrollment. I honestly have never seen it um, in another analysis I've done. Oftentimes, if you construct a very complex model, you can get to 70 and 80% accuracy in a prediction, but very seldom can you get there with just one, one thing. 
So, you know, what's really going on is the economy's good and people are going out and getting jobs. And with the increase in minimum wages in many states, they're getting jobs at what they perceive to be good paychecks. Here's the catch. When you look at the history of employment and wages, um, people with a high school degree do come out and they actually often earn the same amount as a college grad when they start. Uh, but then the gap widens and within five or 10 years, a typical college grad is going to be earning twice as much as a high school grad. So it's a very, you know, and then, and then, and then there are all sorts of other things going on. Um, there in the enrollment data, the other big pattern I think people need to be aware of is white men are not going to college. The college enrollment rate of white men is down eight points. If we could fix that and just get it back to its own norm, um, the impact on college would be enormous. And by the way, the impact on our society would be enormous. Um, uneducated men um, are not helpful um, in general. And I think the job prospects that they have going forward are going to be increasingly challenging. So, you know, uh, it's it's weird to be talking about, you know, white guys as disadvantaged. Um, and it probably doesn't resonate with very many people, but it is now true that a white male is less likely to be in college than a woman of any ethnicity. Um, and the gap is fairly substantial. So um, that's something we got to get after. It's really not about the general population decline. It is much more about the um, odds of somebody choosing college. So this is a hot topic for me. I hope I haven't overstepped my bounds. Um, please feel free to push back if you feel like I have um, in the chat and uh, or shoot me an email. But uh, it's something we've got to get after. We can't let people keep bad mouthing higher ed uh, using what often is extremely poor or frankly misleading data. Well, I do not see any other questions, just some um, nice thanks for the webinar. So thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. And thank you for all who have been attending. We've loved having you. And I think it was a great conversation. Take care.